Hollywood and the mob, or gangsters, uh, you think the movies, you think James Cagney, you think Edward G. Robinson, or Humphrey Bogart, um, but there was a lot of that kind of stuff going on in real life in Hollywood, oh, yeah. and that's something I wasn't really aware of early on. I, I just discovered it fairly recently that there was a huge mob presence in L.A. Uh, that wanted to take advantage of all the uh, the plentiful action uh, happening in, in Southern California. And so that's going to be our topic today on Hollywood Crime Scene. I'm Joe Johnson. I'm joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey, hey. And Andrew Walker. Yes, hello, hello. All right, so that's going to be our theme today is the, the mob influence uh, during that golden age of Hollywood. Um, so the first person that I'm going to bring up uh, is a guy named Benjamin Siegel. Now I'm a little leery about calling him by his nickname because he wasn't a uh, wasn't real fond of the nickname. Uh-huh. The nickname Bugsy uh, was something that was not said to his face. Uh, it was said to him uh, in the in the tabloids uh, or behind his back, and uh, the word Bugsy meant crazy. Uh, oh. Yeah, nuts. And it, it was probably appropriate when describing him, but uh, you would not want to say that to his face. Um, so Benjamin Siegel, born in 1906, uh, grew up in Brooklyn uh, and was a member of a dirt poor Jewish family. Like they had nothing. Um, so early on in his youth, uh, he met up with a uh, a character named Mo Sedway. We're going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, his name's going to come up again. Um, but when when uh, Bugsy was young, he hooked up with Mo Sedway and ran a protection racket where they basically extorted uh, pushcart owners in New York, saying, "If you pay us protection money." Nothing will happen happen to your produce. <laughs> so at an early age, that was kind of the stuff that he yep. was doing with uh, Mo. Uh, then a little bit later, he's recruited by Meyer Lansky, another name who uh, comes up repeatedly when you talk about the mob. Uh, they basically formed a Jewish gang, and uh, Ben Siegel was the hitman who took out some pretty high-profile uh, mob leaders uh, at the time in New York, and he alienated a lot of people uh, in the uh, East Coast mob syndicate. Um, he was also a childhood friend with Al Capone, and uh, that paid off a little bit later in life when uh, he kind of housed Al Capone when he was wanted. Um, and as a young man, he formed Murder uh, Incorporated, um, and basically was a hired killer to take out uh, fellow rivals and stuff like that. Wait, can um, I ask one question? Was yes. that really the name of his L- yeah. LLC? Well, I don't know if they like <laughs> you know filed the paperwork. Yeah, but that's what they called themselves, <laughs> Murder Incorporated. No shame at all. <laughs> My God. So that was in his youth, <laughs> if you can believe it. So he uh, he got off to an interesting start. A um, little bit later, he married his childhood sweetheart, Esther. Uh, they had two daughters, Millicent and Barbara. Uh, they later divorced. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, when he basically alienated everybody he could alienate on the East Coast, um, basically there was a contract out for his death. And so the East Coast mob said, i tell you what, head out to California. Yeah. Let, let the heat die down a little bit. So they basically sent him out there. Now, another childhood friend that he had was a guy named George Raft. And George Raft had gone out to Hollywood in 1927 um, to be an actor. He okay. didn't look the part. He didn't look like a Hollywood actor. He looked like a gangster. He looked like a mob guy. But they needed character actors in Hollywood. Right. Um, so after doing a bunch of movies, he broke out and became a, uh, a star in Scarface, 1932 version. Uh, he appeared in Some Like It Hot, 
with uh, Jack Lemmon and uh, Tony Curtis. And wow. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, later on, he was in Ocean's Eleven with the Rat Pack. That was wow. 1960. Uh, and just recently, I was I was on a noir kick. I was watching some old film noir, and uh, I, I saw a list of movies that recommended They Drive by Night, which came out in 1940. And uh, George was in that, and it was fantastic, and he was fantastic. Um, so he went out there. He became a star. So when, when uh, Bugsy decided to go out, uh, he had an in, and George introduced him <laughs> to the big names in Hollywood. Imagine that. Imagine going out there and immediately being embraced by Hollywood. Um, uh, and the funny thing is, while, while uh, George Raft didn't look like the actor, Bugsy did. He was good looking, uh, blue eyes, and, and uh, looked the part. He looked like a movie star. As a matter of fact, uh, in the movie Bugsy, uh, they show him sitting in his home watching his uh his uh screen test over and over he had a projector set up in his home and word on the street is he did do a screen test he did a screen test at some hollywood studio they say the film is lost to time but he had ambitions of huh. being a movie star like his childhood friend george raff wow um so while he you know went in the uh the hollywood circles there uh, his main mission was to set up gambling rackets, and he came out there where Jack Dragna had already been established. And yeah. Bugsy sort of took over the number racket from him and really made that a profitable uh, enterprise. Uh, he recruited uh, the notorious Mickey Cohen uh, as his chief lieutenant. Um, and while in L.A., he established a drug trade route to Mexico, ran a major prostitution ring like this guy came in and made yeah. his uh, made himself comfortable uh, in <laughs> L.A. Uh, like I said, through Raft, um, Bugsy rubbed elbows with Clark Gable, Gary Cooper, Cary Grant, uh, as well as studio executives Louis B. Mayer and Jack Warner. And how crazy is this? Gene Harlow was Bugsy's daughter's Millicent godmother. Jean Harlow was her godmother. Wow. Is is that crazy? Yeah. Well. So talk about, you know, being embraced. And not only that, young up-and-coming actors uh, admired Bugsy and wanted to be around him. And some of the names that I read was Tony Curtis and uh, young Frank Sinatra um, admired uh, Ben Siegel and wanted to be in his company. Um, while he was out there, now, I didn't follow through on this to see if, if he actually uh, followed through on this, but... Um, the word is he devised a plan where he wanted to take over the unions, the, you know, the acting guild and all that stuff. And he wanted to have say in whether or not uh, these unions were going to strike in Hollywood. And if the studios wanted these strikes to come to an end, they would have to have a little conference with Ben Siegel and, <laughs> and pay the piper to make these strikes end. Wow. And so I'm going to have to do some research and see uh, how effective that was. But that's that was one of his plans when he went out there is to try to milk the studios as best he could. Um, I did read that he borrowed a ton of money from actors and never paid them back because there, no one in their right mind would come after him and say, hey, uh, you owe me some money. Um, so yeah, he, he really made himself comfortable out there. And they, I read that when he was questioned by the IRS about his income, he said, I'm just lucky at the track. And, uh, he was a presence at the Santa Anita racetrack, which I visited earlier this year. Nope. And it is so historical, this racetrack. It's where the Marx Brothers filmed a day at the races. And oh. all the big celebs of the day were, could be seen at the racetrack. So so Ben Siegel was, was a regular at the Santa Anita racetrack. And where where at in town is that, like, in relation to other it's landmarks? It's in a town called uh, Arcadia, I believe. Uh, I stumbled onto it when I, I visited uh, this um, this garden area. And found out that right across the street was the racetrack. But um, that's where all the big names are. If you okay. do a Google search, you can find all kinds of celebrities hanging out at Santa Anita. Cool. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's where Ben claimed uh, his source of income was being lucky at the tracks. But um, <laughs> he, he ran the books and all that stuff and uh, did well over there. Um, and so now the movie, the, uh, the Bugsy movie starring Warren Beatty, 
uh, basically focuses on uh, Ben's connection to the Flamingo Hotel, yeah, uh, which uh, of course was on the uh, the uh, Vegas Strip. Now, one thing that the movie didn't really acknowledge or just sort of glossed over is they made it look like Ben went out to Vegas, had this epiphany, and said. Uh, we're going to build casinos and hotels here. In reality, there are already a couple of casinos out there. The ball was already rolling. And believe it or not, construction had already begun on the Flamingo. And here's an interesting little tidbit. The person that was building the Flamingo was the same guy who uh, owned and operated Ciro's, the restaurant on Sunset, which today is the uh, comedy store. Oh. Uh, so that building has a long history, wow. and, and his name was William Wilkerson, and so he was a big businessman in L.A. He's the one who had the vision of creating the Flamingo in uh, in Vegas, um, but was discouraged from pursuing it um, to the point where he had to go into hiding, uh, where the mob came in and said, we like that idea, we're going to take that yeah. from you. And Wilkerson was like, I'll go back on Sunset and run my restaurants. Um, so the movie credits Bugsy with creating the Flamingo. In reality, it had already uh, was on its way, and Bugsy and the mob sort of took it over. Right. Um, but one thing that the, the movie did touch on that was accurate in real life is that the mob helped fund uh, the construction of the Flamingo, and they were told it was going to cost X amount of dollars, and it just ran over. Uh, the final costs on it were over $6 million in 1947 yeah. dollars. That's wow. a lot of, and the mob was not happy. Um, the movie talks about skimming off the top. Uh, in the movie, they blame uh, Virginia Hill – who was uh, Bugsy's mistress for skimming off the top. Uh, In reality, it probably was Bugsy skimming off the top himself. He was very (laughs) arrogant. He basically said, no one's going to tell me what to do and how to run my business. Only only God can judge me. (laughs) Except maybe the East Coast Mafia, who was... Who he was (laughs) taking off. Who was funding this thing. Yeah. You don't just... How do you lose... How do you miss six million? I mean, the money's (laughs) going somewhere. So Bugsy had to be... I mean, that's... yeah. And, and he was notorious for spending left and right. Um, in the movie, there's a scene that isn't exactly accurate, but they had Bugsy show up in L.A., see a house that he liked, walked up, knocked on the door, and bought the house from the owner who was in the movie industry. In real life, they may have rented from this guy at, at a, uh, for a short period. In reality, Bugsy was buying a property left and right, and he had his house constructed, for him and his wife and children. So it's not like he just walked up to a house and bought it. He, But he did spend money lavishly buying up property and cars, and he wanted to look the part. And the same thing applied to the Flamingo. He just, you know, would spare no expense. He wanted it to be the greatest hotel and casino in the world and uh, went over budget by a lot. Yeah. Um, now, one little interesting tidbit during the construction of the Flamingo is that he was um, – he was talking to one of the, the head contractor on the on the Flamingo, and in the course of conversation, he confided in the contractor that he had killed several men in his lifetime. <laughs> and uh, Sure, why not? <laughs> and the head contractor gave him this look like, should I be worried? And Bugsy said, oh, don't worry, we only kill each other. <laughs> Which might come to haunt him a little bit <laughs> later. He put that out in the universe. But... You imagine that's like hanging around with Dracula. Don't worry, human. I only eat other vampires. You're fine. <laughs> You're good. So yeah, that's the, that was quoted. He was quoted as saying that to the head contractor at the Flamingo. Uh, so the big day comes. The Flamingo opens on December 26th, day after Christmas, 1946. Uh, at the grand opening, George Raft. The actor who embraced Bugsy brought him out to Hollywood. Um, And the grand opening was a total disaster. That's what I Um, heard, yeah. Yeah. Now, I've read contradicting stories that it rained in Vegas on the day of the opening. But 
what I read that probably was more close to the truth is that L.A. had a monster uh, storm, and a lot of the movie stars that had promised Bugsy that they were going to come out to the grand opening couldn't make it because of the weather. So it wasn't necessarily raining in Vegas. It was right. raining in L.A., but uh, the grand opening was a disaster. Uh, the hotel quickly lost a ton of money. Um, and closed temporarily in January. Uh, just about a month later, they they stopped everything and closed. Now, the movie insinuates that this is the reason why Bugsy Siegel met his demise. But to me, that doesn't quite add up because the casino reopened uh, in March of 1947. It wasn't quite done during the, the grand opening um, but when it reopened in March of 1947, just a few months later, it began to turn a profit. So I kind of question why the mob would want to take out Bugsy um, if now all of a sudden the casino is turning a profit. Now, in the movie, they made it look like the grand opening was a failure. Bugsy came home and was murdered that night. In reality, his death didn't come for six months. Right. The mob's going to give you some time. To, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. So let's talk about that fateful night. So on the night of June 20th, 1947, uh, Bugsy sitting in the living room of a rented home rented by Virginia Hill, who just scratched the surface on Virginia Hill. That was his mistress. She was classic definition of a, how do you pronounce it? Mall, M-O-L-L, mob, mall. Um, She was big into the mafia. She was into pornography and prostitution. She loved running in the circles uh, uh, with the mobsters, and she was uh, Ben's mistress. Um, and so he's at her rented Beverly Hills. Uh, uh, Ben's in the rented Beverly Hills home when, uh, oh, and, and he was also, there was someone there with him. Alan Smiley was in the living room with him. That was also glossed over in the movie they made it look like he was just there alone okay um as they're sitting there uh ben's flipping through the la times when nine shots are fired through the window from a military grade rifle <laughs> um and two of them were headshots which uh uh you're not going to survive as a matter no. of fact uh when they were cleaning up the crime scene they found his eyeball somewhere else um <laughs> As a matter of fact, you can find the gruesome crime scene photos online. And the actual not, eyeball? Yeah. Uh, well, you, there's not like a photo of the eyeball, but there's pretty gruesome photos of yeah, there was Ben like still a, sitting on the sofa. Yeah, about like 10 or 15 feet away, and then they show him like splayed out on the ground, and you see blood. Over, yeah. Yeah. And so it was a gruesome crime scene. and um, Your discretion is advised. <laughs> exactly. It, yeah. Let there be a disclaimer you, if you choose to look these up. You don't really see that that much today do you like if a famous person is brutally murdered unless yeah. no they try unless to... it gets leaked but this yeah. was put out officially by the yeah law appar- enforcement? apparently some of these gruesome photos made the papers and the tabloids yeah so tabloids yeah. for sure tabloids were always that especially in, out, out yeah. in la they'd want to get their hands on uh, something like that and, oh. so <laughs> um the day after this grisly murder which no one was ever charged with um Mo Sedway, his childhood friend, uh, and his associates walked into the Flamingo and took over operations of the hotel and casino. That led to speculation that the murder and the hotel were connected. Um, well, that's fair. I mean, <laughs> Bugsy gets murdered. Whoever walks in, dude, you're going to be the, an automatic suspect. <laughs> right. <exactly. laughs> it comes with the territory. It's like, oh, you're, you're the new owners of the Flamingo? Okay. They did it. So that's the prevailing theory. That's what the movie addressed. The 1991 movie uh, basically says that Siegel was killed due to cost over, overruns and uh, su- suspected skimming uh, and all that stuff. And, um, and the movie, like I said, suggested that Virginia Hill was doing the skimming, but Bugsy kind of looked the other way. Uh, I don't know if there's any evidence in real life that Virginia had anything to do with that aspect. Even if of she it, did, but... that's your mistress, man. You're right. going to die. The mom buzz is like, oh, is that your woman that's skimming off the door? Oh, then all's forgiven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's her fault. Uh, so that's the, the prevailing theory, um, and it's probably the likely right. theory. Um, there's another theory 
uh, will have you scratching your head. Virginia Hill had a couple of brothers. One of them stayed at that Beverly Hills uh, home for a little while. And it was common knowledge that Bugsy smacked Virginia around quite a bit. Even though they had a passionate love affair, uh, they got into it quite a bit. So there's a theory out there um, that uh, maybe one of the brothers took Bugsy out uh, because they were getting tired of him smacking their sister around. And here's a little, I don't know, circumstantial evidence is that coincidentally, when Bugsy was gunned down in the living room, Virginia Hill was out of town. She she was in Europe or something uh, during that murder. So why was she out of town? There could lead to all kinds of speculation there. Uh, or it could have just been a coincidence. Um, or maybe the shooter knew that she was going to be away and found sure. and, and figured that would be a, a opportunity to take care of that. It can't be dismissed. Let's put it that way. Exactly. Yeah. Now, there's a third theory. This is the one that I'm buying into, and I just read about this recently as I was doing research on this. This sounds the most plausible to me. So during all this flamingo controversy and everything like that, apparently Bugsy spoke out loud that he wanted to kill Mo Sedway, his childhood friend. They grew up together. Mo got him into this business, and in a... Uh, fit of rage, Bugsy threatened Moe's life. Now, was he serious? Was he just spouting? Who knows? But Moe was really bothered by that. Now, this is where things get really complicated, and I'm just going to try and streamline this story. Moe okay. was married to a woman named B. Uh, they had a son named Robbie. B was in a relationship with kind of a bodyguard type guy named Matthew Moose Panza. And Mo was cool with it. He's like, whatever makes my wife happy. And so <laughs> Mo and Moose were buddies knowing that she was Ugh. in the middle. It's such an odd story. As a matter of fact, I think there's evidence that little Robbie was Moose's son because as he got older, he looked like Moose. <laughs> God, yes. So I'm going off track here, but this kind of sets up this theory. Um, so when this threat was made on Moe's life, basically Moe and B turned to Moose and said, we can't have this hanging over our heads. Can you take care of it? Now, Robbie is the one who kind of broke this story when he said that on basically on her deathbed, uh, B, the mom, when Robbie said, do you know who killed Bugsy? She said, oh, yeah, it was Moose. And so Moose did it as a favor to Mo, who was looking the other way with their relationship. Uh, B was his lover. So Moose said, I'll do you a solid. B claims that um, Moose followed Bugsy around L.A. that day. He stopped at, I think it was the Beverly Hills Hotel, where he picked up the copy of the L.A. Times newspaper that he was reading uh, on the sofa. Um, Bugsy went back to the home, sat down on the couch, was flipping through the newspaper when shots rang out and uh, came through the window. Um, to me, that makes a lot of sense. Like, that, there's so much detail there, it's hard to think, okay, B just sort of made that up for attention. Like, why would she do that? So in my opinion, after doing all this research, to me that sounds like a, a pretty logical reason for taking Bugsy out. Because like I said, the Flamingo had turned profitable. Why would the mob go after him after the Flamingo started sure. turning a profit? Uh, was it the brothers? Maybe, maybe not. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of weight behind that. This third theory that Moose did it as a favor to Mo and B makes a lot of sense to me. And and. and it's kind of a, a, a romantic gesture, I guess. Wow. So, I mean, well, yeah, look, I mean, if you, if you steal from the mob, that's cardinal sin number one. You make threats to the mob, that's part of cardinal sin. There's probably like uh, rules of do do's and don'ts. Yeah, yeah. Don't speak out loud that you're going to kill someone, especially in mob circles. Don't steal from them. Because if you can steal, maybe you pay it back, but it's the act of stealing that will get you killed. Yeah. But I like, I like this one. That also, if I might try to add a little bit more speculation, if we can, 
you don't kill Bugsy Siegel without approval because that's Jack Dragna. Exactly. Wasn't allowed to touch him. And was said if you touch him, if you even sneeze at him, yeah. bad things happen to you. So if Bugsy has a lot of enemies he made in the East Coast and had to the heat to die if it comes off here, he's treating, you know, he's doing all this kind of stuff. I mean, does Moose want to die? You kill Bugsy Siegel, they're going to someone from the East Coast is going to look into it, and they say, "Oh." But think about where Mo ranks in the hierarchy of the mob, and there was basically one person who's going to sign off on Bugsy's death, and that was Mo. And so I feel like Mo was the person who was in the position of power to take out Bugsy without being retaliated against. So, wow. so I mean, we'll never know for no, sure. That's true. But man, there's a lot of detail in that third theory and, and it makes a lot of sense to me i like it i like the third theory and here's something that's interesting uh, again going down this rabbit hole uh the address of the uh, assassination was was posted so i went to google and uh, typed in the address went to google earth street view and that home still exists today and there's a crime scene photo of investigators in the driveway of the neighboring house and when I went to Google Earth Street View, that driveway is unchanged. So hmm. where the the sniper fired from and the home that Bugsy died in is still standing today. And that just moved up my list of places well. to visit <laughs> next time in L.A. Uh, I got to see that. I got to check that what out. What neighborhood was that in? Uh, Beverly Hills, the home oh, yeah. Beverly okay. Hills, yeah. And you know what? When you when you commit a crime, a murder in one of those well well to do areas, you know that's gonna get could you imagine going to that person's house? Hi. <laughs> you live in the house that Bugsy Siegel got murdered in. Yeah. And I'm sure they're aware of that. I oh my god. Probably is once, that, once a week you? somebody oh, stops sure. by and <laughs> Yeah. It's like Maryland's house or the Back to the Future house. There are people stop by on a daily basis just to stand and in the front of go, and, and, and I people, get it. Come on in. People live in those houses today? Apparently, yeah. They're, okay, they're, I, I wasn't yeah. aware. I hope they changed I, the poll screen. I thought I was under the impression that uh, the Back to the Future house was uh, a set. No. Nope. Is a real neighborhood? The, the McFly house that has the uh, the towers behind it, like the high, high yeah. power tower. That's I visited that house. Uh-huh. It's in a neighborhood. I forget which community it's in, but uh, okay. the homeowners aren't big fans of visitors, but you can pull up and uh, see the house and see where Doc Brown flies off at the end of the uh, the film and all that stuff. Hopefully so. someday uh, th- s- somebody can, uh, I don't know, if raise money or whatever and try to buy them out and turn it into like a museum. <laughs> and an attraction, like they did yeah. with, uh, with the uh, Christmas Story house in Cleveland. Okay. Uh, a fan of the, the Christmas Story movie bought that house and turned it into an attraction. And awesome. you can visit that house. And even the interior has been renovated to look like the interior. That actually was a soundstage uh, in the film. But you can visit that house and go inside. How oh, cool okay. would it be to do that with the Back to the Future? Back to the Future yeah. is, I mean, not to say anything, not to make a, a Christmas story small, but Back to the Future is way bigger. Oh, sure. Oh, and yeah. there, that, that would be it. I would love to visit. I, I would visit if I ever make yeah. it out to L.A., and if that was the thing, I would go. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take you on the Back <laughs> to the Future tour because not only did I visit the McFly house, I visited Doc Brown's mansion and garage from 1955 where he built the DeLorean. Uh, I visited uh, George McFly's home as a youth. Uh, Lorraine's house where you can peep, uh, where George peeped on her <laughs> changing. You can visit all of those homes. Those, I believe, are in Pasadena, I want to say. Um, cool. So you could do an entire Back to the Future tour, Joe, including the mall. do they have 1955 Doc Brown's house? Yes, yeah, the mansion. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, just, it's actually, the, the interesting thing about Doc Brown's house is is it's a it's a tourist attraction. It's it's called oh. the Gamble House of Proctor and Gamble fame. Oh. And it's like a museum that you can visit. Cool. And the garage where um, Doc Brown builds the DeLorean and Marty's knocking on the door going, I know how you got the bop on your head. Uh, that's a bookstore. And uh, <laughs> you can go in there and shop for books. Cool. Um, and I remember I was there just around closing time. And as they close those doors, I'm like, this is it. This is uh, Doc Brown's garage. Is, it, is uh, Twin Pines Mall uh, still yes, standing? Yes, it is. That's or in Lone the, uh, Pine Mall, whatever you, 
Yeah. <laughs> Whatever version you're in. <laughs> That's in the city of uh, industry. That's the Puente Hills Mall, I think it's called. Okay. Um, nice. And it looks very similar. Uh, and it did. So so getting back to Bugsy, yeah. I would yeah, love yeah. to do the Bugsy tour, visit yeah. the home. Uh, you could visit his grave. He's at the uh, Hollywood Forever Cemetery, which is the famous cemetery next to Paramount Studios. Um, so it would be fun to go next time I go to L.A. to do a little a Bugsy tour and check out some of those iconic uh, locations. Well, Joe, but... let us know. I think we'd like to join you. <laughs> I think that's the whole point. You go, you go on these other tours and like, and tell us about it. I need I'll to start saving you. money. Yeah, I'll join you. Now, one name that came up in my my research um, when when Bugsy came out and and teamed up with Mickey Cohen, uh, there was a name that was mentioned in passing uh, that around that time Mickey Cohen had a bodyguard. And his name was Johnny Stampanato. Yes. Andrew, can you elaborate on Johnny Stampanato? Why does that name sound familiar? It sounds familiar because I just learned about this dude uh, <laughs> two weeks ago from our, our off off, uh, off radio banter. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, s- kind of similar upbringing to, uh, to Bugsy, except uh, he grew up in Chicago. Stampanato did. He was the youngest kid, and unfortunately, his mother died six days after he was born. Yeah, geez. yeah. So it, it seemed that he had a slightly more stable, slightly more middle class upbringing. Okay. Than um, than Siegel, um. But it seems like at a very young age he could not stay out of trouble. Mm. He uh, he was in the Marines. He was in the Pacific Theater met uh, a Turkish woman in China uh, when he was stationed there. I, I forgot U.S. troops were stationed in China hmm. a- after World War II. Yeah, yeah, for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and I have a minor in history, and, and I, I didn't know that. Anyway, um, he, she was Turkish and uh, Muslim. He converted to Islam to marry her, um, but that didn't last very long. Um I don't remember exactly how, how long it lasted. He met another woman. Um, oh wait, wait no. he he had a, a child with this woman. Okay, but then whatever for whatever reason he deserted him, like a lot of people, and he went to Hollywood. You know, just seeking that. At that time, Hollywood was the up and coming thing. Yeah, um, wasn't from what I know wasn't particularly artistic or <laughs> photogenic photogenic and wasn't interested in the arts i think he was just so used to b- being a troublemaker and a grifter growing up that he saw hollywood as as a gold mine yeah an opportunity yeah an opportunity and he uh went out there start started a semi shady uh business that that uh tried to sell pottery it was marketed as fine art, but it was, you know, just crap. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, you get this kind of sense of what this guy was. Um, married another woman, and within three months, she was like, you know, this isn't working out. We're getting divorced. So, you know, you start to see a pattern when you read this guy's biography. Um, and becomes, uh, because of his underworld connections in the Hollywood scene, becomes bodyguard mm-hmm. to uh, Mickey Cohen. And uh, um, and to contrast Bugsy Siegel, who seems like he could not keep his mouth shut, no matter what he did, he would tell everything. Um, commit, you know, admit to wanting to kill people, admitting yeah. to crimes. Uh, this dude was the opposite from from what people have said that he was. He was pretty quiet, you know, more observant and trying to take things in. Um, so he was kind of a, a good uh, yin and yang to his boss. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, you get the – I don't know if you could call him a fixer. I, I, I don't know what kind of stuff he did behind the scenes, but he was a bodyguard officially. Um, then he meets a uh, very uh, popular actress at the time, Lana Turner, sometime in, I think, the mid or late 50s. Um, she was also – I. I just read this uh, by researching more. I didn't know a whole lot about Lana Turner, but 
She was also kind of a piece of work. She had, <laughs> she uh, apparently had been married seven times. And, <laughs> oh, man. You know, the um, sanctity of marriage. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, like a lot of people out there, just you know, really obsessed with looks, glamour, the spectacle of everything. Um, now she was, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful yes stars of. All time in Hollywood. I, I recently watched another film noir movie called The Postman Always Rings Twice. Yeah. John Garfield and, and Lana Turner. And okay. the way they f- photographed her face, I was like, that it doesn't look real. Like yeah. it looked like someone painted that on a canvas. She, she was stunning. Yeah, she, the cinematography on that was phenomenal. Uh yes. Beautiful woman. Um up there with, in my opinion, uh, I think Grace Kelly was my God, one of the most beautiful women at that time in Hollywood. Um, but anyway, um, they, as you could imagine, had a t- tumultuous relationship, which by more than one account was uh, physically abusive. Mm-hmm. He apparently beat her. Um, and Lana had a daughter from a previous relationship named Cheryl. And she was just a teenager at the time, but apparently... And this is where things, we don't really know what happened factually. But Cheryl heard her mom and uh, Johnny fighting, grabbed a knife from the kitchen, and stabbed him once. But it was a, it, it was a, a, a big stab. It wasn't just a, you know, a one-inch deep stab. It uh, apparently hit uh, an aorta and his oh. liver, and uh, th- that did him in. Wow. Um, Jeez. Yeah. And so she turned herself in, and um, I, I guess there was a, a trial. I don't. There was. I, yeah, okay, there was a trial. There's photos of Lana on the witness stand, which some people describe as her greatest performance ever. Yeah. That she whipped up like crocodile tears and put probably on a, a show for the press. Pr- probably inspiration from for Amber Heard. Uh, oh sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not to bring that clown show up. That's. <laughs> I'm sorry for doing a disservice to this podcast by bringing that crap up. But I mean, there, there's, you know, it's possible. It's it's believable that that could be the case. So anyway. Uh, now Cheryl was a minor at the time, yeah, right? F- yeah, fourteen, okay. young. Um. And. I'm trying to get remember my facts. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, she, you know, of course, she uh, pled uh, pretty much self defense um, that she was trying to save her mother's life. Mm-hmm. Okay, which is it's not implausible that that story because we know his past and right the the abuse and everything. Yeah. Sure. Um, but then in 1996, a dude named Eric Root, who Apparent, I've never heard of the dude until I did this research. It was a hairdresser to the stars, and I, I guess is still alive to this day. Oh, wow. He uh, wrote, a, uh, wrote a book basically saying, um, yeah, Lana confided in me. Uh, I killed him, and I'd do it again. Apparently, she walked in on him and her daughter. Ooh. Um, wow. So. Wow. I didn't hear that part of it. Interesting. Right, and so, and and then later on, uh, uh, Cheryl she wrote publicly uh, before her mother's death that, yeah, he he sexually abused me. Wow. So. So so then. Yeah, that the, would do the it. next logical question would be, but who really killed him? Yeah. Was it the daughter or was it Lana? Well, that might explain <laughs> the performance yes. aspect on the witness stand and the crocodile tears because I read something similar, not to the degree that you just described, but there is speculation that Lana, for whatever reason, was the one who stabbed Johnny. And with Cheryl being a minor, they said, look, if you go up on the stand and said you did it in self-defense, you were protecting your mom, you more than likely yeah. will walk and everyone will have sympathy for you. And right. And so that's how they it played out on court in court, and that's why they considered it a drama, uh, when in reality that may, might not have how it went down. Right. Um, the some more claims that uh, Eric Root 
writes in his book is that he uh, had uh, had the weapon, uh, the the knife, and removed the <laughs> Lana's fingerprints and put the daughter's fingerprints on it. Who what did that? What kind well, of hairdresser is this? Wait, maybe it wasn't Eric Rue, but but he he said that huh. I think somebody he alleged that somebody wiped off Lana's fingerprints right. and, and had so that I I don't you know that might be that. Kind of sounds maybe far fetched, but who knows? Yeah, he, yeah at that point. Um, but hmm. uh, he's adamant that she told him a lot of things about her uh, romantic partners. You know, intimate stuff that hmm. I guess you know. If you're a hairdresser and you that get that part's believable, you, get, you spend a lot of time in that makeup chair, right? And yeah. and she did. She was well known for looking her best, and if oh, she sure. did not look her best, she would not leave the house. I I read that too. So. It's it's one of those things that and stars get we, very particular about that. If they they get attached to a hairdresser, they'll want them for all their yeah, projects. And and, and and who knows? Uh, maybe someday, um, uh, maybe on this guy's deathbed, maybe he will say, you know, I got to come clean. It yeah, it, it was a lie. I you know, is Cheryl still alive? The do- the yeah. stepdaughter. Okay, so she's doing real. She's she, hmm. she's doing real estate. Uh, Boy. the. the uh, I just I, I perused her wow. wiki page. She's doing real estate uh, outside of the city. I, I, I think up in Palm Springs, as of four years ago, as of 2018. Yeah. She's written three fictional books. Uh, after I think after her memoir about you know her life and abuse and everything. Right. Um. Interesting. Interesting enough. Uh, each of the the three books have the word death. In the title. Oh, wow. So there's a fixation of death. What I would not <laughs> give to sit down in a private booth at Musso and Frank's, <laughs> just between you and I, just tell me what happened. Tell me what, what you saw. Man, that would be from, fascinating. From what I gather, she is more of a recluse. And oh, I can I, imagine. Maybe not oh, fully yeah. recluse, but... Uh, and I imagine she gets inquiries... Oh, about shit. stuff all the time. I'd imagine it'd be difficult. But hey man, next time you're out there, it's it's there's there's nothing wrong with trying. <laughs> you, know what, you know what blows my mind is you think these sensational events that happen, they seem like they were such a long time ago, but these people are still with us. They're still yeah. around. People who've witnessed historic moments. Like I remember being shocked fairly recently to find out that Lee Harvey Oswald's wife is still walks among us. Really? The things that she knows, the things that she saw. Um, Tex, I forget the guy's name, but Tex, who was depicted in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the guy who um, murdered Sharon Tate still walks among us. He's in jail. He's father children. Uh, that guy is still sitting in prison somewhere. And you think, gosh, these these... Horrible crimes happened such a long time ago, but these perpetrators, these witnesses, are still here, still with us. Yeah, is, is that who uh, was portrayed by uh, the guy who plays Elvis? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and okay. Uh, yeah, those. There, it, it blows my mind. Blows my mind. Like, think about what that text guy did, what he witnessed, what he saw, committed one of the most horrific murders in the history of the world because it it changed the world when it happened and. They're still there. They're they're still alive. That and it makes you realize they weren't that long ago, man. It's wild. We we are running out on time on uh, Cheryl Crane though. She is seventy nine. Oh wow. So, okay. um, but yeah, I mean the fact that there there hasn't been any news about her in the last four years that I could find. I'd imagine she's probably just sick of that whole thing and just. Mm. Wants to live out her, you know, twilight years yeah. do, doing what she what she does. Wow, um, you you can imagine that Hollywood has definitely approached her to adapt oh, yeah. adapt her novels or right. her memoir. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and I just um, the 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 little bit of uh, you know information I I have I I have the feeling that whether she did it or not, you know, obviously there's a certain amount of trauma and pain that she probably just. Wants to leave in the past. Oh, and, sure. Um, Let's put it this way. Even if she did do it, I don't think you could find a jury now that would convict her 
because if you say that she was being, if she claims I'm, oh, I was yeah. being sexually assaulted and raped, right, by, right, and no one came to help me, yeah, and one day I just had enough and I lashed out. Okay, you know yeah. what? Right. They would ple- They would say time. You know, probation, community service. I mean, and he just stopped. And Bernardo she, just seemed like a bad, yeah. bad. And she's seventy nine. Right. And I mean, e- even if Lana Turner really uh, did it, I. <sighs> She would, she would still, I mean, she would still get the sympathy. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, she, she, she would still have, she would probably serve time today, but mm-hmm. it would be understandable that, okay, like she, she could probably provide facts. Like I was in danger and yeah. there are numerous times in the past. And uh, also going back to that dude, uh, Eric Root, he said that the knife apparently that was, used it wasn't a kitchen knife it was a knife that she kept in her bedstand because that's how afraid she wow. was of him okay wow that's how afraid that of she was of the man who she was intimate with and shared a bed with hmm. now think about that relationship yeah yeah that i mean that that's you know kind of well not to go back to depp and herd but i mean that's that level of both sides uh well, i mean one side a little worse than the other but yeah both sides uh Oh yeah, I mean, if you talk about destructive the, relationships in Hollywood, that's still going on today. And yeah, we, and, it's, pe- and we it's, know people that outside of Hollywood do that. Kind yeah, of stuff. yeah, it's yeah. yeah. Yep. But why? Why would she keep going back to this guy? Like, was she into it? Like, did she like the rough stuff? I mean, it's all speculation. Right. But I, I can never understand why a, a person like Lana, with the power and the money and the prestige, would want to associate herself with this scumbag. Right, and it's it's not like he was. Uh, I don't know who would be the. The, yeah. the top three leading dudes in the late 50s. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, it's not Gary like he, Cooper, Clark Gable. Yeah, well, he's not that kind of delves into the psychology yeah, of yeah. domestic abuse. And yeah. They, there's right. a whole thing about that where exactly. sometimes they just can't get out of it. And, sure. Yeah. Hmm. Sure. The, and then the, 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 yeah, the whole codependency, codependency type right. thing probably plays. Oh, a part but into even it. for a long attorney, if, if someone told you, like, hey, I walked in and, you know, this guy was, you know, raping my kid. I, I mean, what jury's going to be like, yeah, you know what? I still think you should go to jail. Like, that's going to be a tough sell. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, how would anybody yeah. react in that situation? It, it would either be death or you're, you're going to beat the crap out of that person. Even if you have, a, ju- you have a jury of single father, you know, parentless, kid, you know, childless <laughs> people, yeah. they're not going to be like, yeah, you know what? I don't have kids, but yeah, you're, you're, you're going to the chair. Yeah. Yep. Now, we got about 10 minutes left in the podcast. Uh, imagine those Pete, um, when Bugsy came out to LA, right. It's not like he invented the West coast mob. It had sort of a foothold. Do you want to touch on that yeah. a little bit? <laughs> and this is exactly the amount, amount of time my, my guy deserves, unfortunately. <laughs> and I feel bad saying this, but, uh, okay. We were, you mentioned Jack Dragner earlier and Jack Dragner was basically the, for lack of a better, he was the head of the LA crime, uh, LA mafia uh, out there. And, Look, it sounds sounds exotic, sounds nice, but you know he had his hand in 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 extortion. It, black, they call it black hand extortion, where they make the threats with their own people, and they say, "Hey, pay protection money." And these guys won't bother him. Like you're the one threatening me. Yeah. And then you know he was doing before pro you know prohibition, uh, or during prohibition. You know he was you know doing bootlegging, but after that he got into uh, heroin smug you know smuggling heroin, and he would prey on the unions of the laundromats and importing dresses as from what I read. So it wasn't something sexy like screenwriters, actors, directors, you know, you know, cinematography, none of that kind of stuff, you know, heavy labor unions, no, nothing against laundromats or important, all important. But I'm just saying he kind of missed out to that uh, guys who had vision like Bugsy, hmm. who saw this as a missed opportunity. Uh, Dragno, you know, he's, you know, he's your typical, you know, you know, immigrant uh, came from Sicily. Came over. Uh, the only time he actually spent time in jail was when he was, in, you know, in 1915, around that time. You know, it was like, that was the only time he actually spent, every time that time has been alleged. Comes out to L.A., sets up, you know, he, he had a, he had a gambling ship. Uh, these are these were pretty big. For, you know, Earl Warren, who had become Chief, Chief Justice Earl Warren of the mm. Supreme Court, he, and before then he was a district attorney and then became governor of California. Right. People were like, "Hey, I'm going to set up gambling. I'm going to go just off the inter- inter- international waters, which is about three miles off, you know, Santa Monica." I've, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. So, Jack Dragna wants to get in on that, and he gets a a, a Monofalcone, I think, is the name of the ship. 
and it sounded great. And this is what I feel bad. I researched this. Full disclosure, everybody. I, I, when I was researching my mafia guy, I didn't read past the two lines. And I, I said, oh, this guy has his hands and everything. So this would be great. <laughs> nope. This guy ended up becoming second fiddle to everyone. Yeah. At least that's how the, you know, history is written by the victors. So sure. whoever, all the victors said that, that my guy, Jack Ragnar, <laughs> I say my guy, my topic, didn't, you know, couldn't measure up. I mean, he, I mean, not to say that he wasn't dangerous. I mean, you know, he could threaten murder, but compared to Bugsy and and Andrew's guy and all most of the major crime families, they were Chicago, New York didn't really they call him the Mickey Mouse Mafia. <laughs> they call him the head musketeer of the Mickey Mouse Mafia. You talk about disrespectful in the eyes of the mafia families across the country. Hmm. They're like, Okay. So that's why they felt they could just come in there. That's why they send Bugsy out there to say, Hey, let's see if we can, you know, organize this thing. And Dragna was not going to say anything. This guy, so he, you know, he established, he, you know, he was head of the LA crime family from like 1931 to 1956 up to his death. So, you know, then Bugsy comes in and says, "Hey, this is what we're going to do." And, you know, I will say this: Dragna had this more. He didn't like the attention. He didn't even want to touch Hollywood to the fact where he couldn't get in. You know, he'd have to pay to get into a movie theater compared to Bugsy and, and, yeah. and these other guys. And he wouldn't touch, and people thought he was backwards for doing that. Like, oh, you're too old school for a mafia guy. You gotta, you know, you're, you're, you're live a little, have a little glitz, have some power. And they said that he could never really do anything. When Mickey Cohen, uh, you know, when they tried to go after Mickey Cohen, you know, nothing really happened. Hmm. You know, he he tried to, he tried to attack. He'd say, okay, let, let's question Dragon and his family. And then people like Dragner, really, this guy, this guy's going to try and make it do a hit on Cohen of all the people. When Bugsy got uh, murdered mm -hmm. and the people in one of the, uh, what is it, Lansky, I think? Meyer Lansky. My, yeah. Meyer Lansky, mm -hmm. yeah. I think we were talking about this. And when they asked Lansky, and Lansky says, oh, no, it was probably Dragna. And people went, really, you're going to drag Dragna into this? You want us to believe that Dragna was the one that took the hit out on Bugsy, even though there was an explicit order. You touch Bugsy, New York and Chicago are going to come and end you and your family. Yeah. So, you know, look, you know, look, he did drug smug heroin smuggling. He tried to get with the unions, not the big ones. You know, did bootlegging, was uh, big into gambling. But all in all, it was an unremarkable career. In 1950, his wife dies in 53, who was his second cousin. You know, didn't marry a Hollywood star, didn't have any of these relationships, hmm. you know, and hmm. he died, you know, when she died, he tried, you know, tried to go on other dates. The, 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 there was a new, uh, in fact, the people around Dragner were the big, were the bigger stars. Yeah. One of his, sub, one of his uh, uh, associates was uh, handsome Johnny Roselli, who would, saw the benefit of going to Vegas and would end up going, you know, being the contact in Vegas who ended up getting recruited by the CIA in a plot to assassinate Castro. <laughs> you know, one of his other right-hand guys, uh, Momo Adamo, you know, when, when uh, Dragna died, people thought that he would be the next one to be voted in. Then DeSimone gets elected, voted in. He goes down to San Diego, commits a murder-suicide with his wife because his wife's having an affair with him. He shoots his wife in the head. She survives. <laughs> he killed himself. Wow. I mean, uh, I'm uh. just saying, you know, oh, or Anthony Sereno, the guy who was leading the thing on gambling ships. Sereno's more famous for his gambling ship because he would fight, you know, Earl Warren's like, uh, when people, he got tipped off that Earl, Earl, Earl Warren was sending the cops, pulls up the things, gets the hose out, starts hosing on the cops, <laughs> saying, you're not getting on my ship, Jeez. throwing brandy to the uh, to the press to keep them going. And then after eight <laughs> days, surrenders because he's like, I needed to get a haircut. Oh, when Earl gosh, Warren, Warren was basically saying, we're going to call the Navy, we're going to sink your ship. <laughs> That's those, That was like the underlying thing. Like, you keep this stuff up, screw, we're just going to do it. They're like, your guys are pirates. Like, no, you're just going to die. <laughs> so... All these other guys around Dragna have better stories than my yeah, guy. But each one of them could be the subject of a movie. Right. But, I mean, it is interesting, though, that for, for uh, you know, a number of years, he was still. Right. I mean, he's that. He was, the, you know, be, I guess behind the scenes and. Right. No, he, he was that stable figure. Like, he yeah. had his hands and everything. You still wouldn't mess with him. You wouldn't walk up to him and insult him, you know? Be, because I mean, he could have one of his dudes right. take care of it. But then. But he didn't go out and. He he was basically Bo boast about if killing you have people. Thirty one flavors of mafia. He was vanilla, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with vanilla. But when you have other flavors, when you have like chocolate crazy, like Bugsy come up, <laughs> and people are like, hey, <laughs> you know why? Do, you know, so 
you know, it's he never even wanted to go into Hollywood. And it was you talk about missed opportunities. I would I would say the same thing. I'd be like, Dragna, look at look at Hollywood. What what is yeah. this? You're in the the land of dreams. You got to yeah. I, I could easily see why Bugsy came out there and said, oh, my God, look at this missed opportunity. You're not even taking advantage of even in the even in extortion. Even in 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 racket in in for uh, gambling uh, and managing the bookies, that was the one thing that Dragna did well. He let the bookies operate, and it was like this uneasy peace that he kept with them. Then Bugsy came in, and got a little hard, you know, ham, you know, heavy-handed, killed one of the bookies, and that mm. opened up the floodgates mm. for destabilizing. So that was one thing where people were like, hey, maybe Dragna had a point there. Hmm. You know, what's interesting is Dragna. You know, he he took offense to having a be a second banana to yeah. Bugsy, but the East Coast mob said you're, you're going to like it. Uh, Mickey Cohen in in the movie Bugsy, at first he was kind of put off by Bugsy, but he embraced that relationship so much that when and this is really fascinating when when Bugsy got killed, Mickey Cohen lost his mind was told that the shooters were staying at the Hollywood Roosevelt, which I visited many, many times, walked into the front lobby, screamed out for the shooters to come down and confront them in the lobby, and fired shots into the ceiling of the the Roosevelt, the Hollywood Roosevelt, and the shooters never came down, but the police arrived, so Mickey skedaddled. And in Bugsy's wake, not Dragna, Mickey Cohen became the celebrity yeah. he people wanted to schmooze and hobnob with this known killer um until he died of stomach cancer in his 60s but mickey cohen became a celebrity yeah. because of his affiliation with bugsy and even, even in the movie scene. bugsy that you're watching i in, in bugsy they portray dragna as having to get on his knees and and bark like a dog and make <laughs> no, like oink oh jeez. Yeah. i mean it's you know like I said, you know what what was sensationalized, what's not. Sometimes yeah, sure. that part may not be that part might be sensationalized, but the 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 vibe of disrespect and you're a second sure. fiddle, you're a background player, let the big boys play. Yeah, you know it's probably sensationalized, but trying to show this is the type of duty was for future reference. I need to read beyond the two lines before I pick <laughs> my tie. That's right. That's all I'm saying. That's right. Dig deep. I have I I have a question. I know we we're almost out of time. Um, but uh, I was just thinking about this. Do you th- do you think there's uh, like what's what's the mob or the mafia in Los Angeles today? Not 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 in the same sense of these dudes. Right. Does some form of that oh, exist? Yeah. And like, you know, are there known? I think they've maybe di- key I think they've diversified. Or do you think it's more of a uh, a double-edged thing of the police getting wise to it and cracking down on it, and then on the business end, it becoming more mainstream and and corporate. Yeah, I mean, and so there was no need for. I would think if if a mob exists in Hollywood today, it would be the movie studio. Yeah, <laughs> I think they're okay. the ones that okay, are the so- muscle and has the you know the clean up the 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 dirty laundry and all that stuff. So, so I, I don't know if so much a mob exists in Hollywood today, yeah, but it's just but like the influence of the movie studio, just like anything it, it morphs and uh, I guess survival of the fittest. And uh, man. for instance, <laughs> how, when they say, let's ever, if you ever audit the books on studios, like how they say mo- movies don't make money. Cause that's all they always say. Oh, we'll pay you on the back end. Oh, you know, gross oh, versus net, yeah. all that kind of dialogue. Yeah. So if you imagine I could, you know what's the evolution of the mafia now? Just don't be out in the open. Kind of blend into the shadows. <laughs> yeah. Go into le- shell companies, legitimate area. You know whatever front companies are out there. Yeah, I could see it. Yeah. It wouldn't yeah. shock me if someone said, "Hey, the mafia still exists in L.A. right now." Sure. <laughs> it's just in a different form. <laughs> That's right. Well, that brings us to uh, the end of this episode of Hollywood Crime Scene. Uh, I really enjoyed researching this one yes. and, and talking oh, about this. And, I'd like uh, to point out, Joe came in on his vacation to do this, everybody. That's, right. that's dedication. I'd like to point is, out. That's, this is not work. This is fun <laughs> for Oh, me. I did. So. Oh, you did mention that. that you, <laughs> okay. on his va- I remember when Joe said, he's like, oh, I'll come in and do it. I'm like, now that's, that's dedication. Hey. It's there pleasure. It's and fun. we'll be back again soon. We got some great topics lined up. We're going to talk about uh, Platinum Blondes, yes. uh, focusing on Marilyn Monroe. Yep. Uh, and we got all kinds of fun things lined up for uh, the future. So 
We will see you again soon on the next exciting episode of Hollywood Crime Scene. Thanks, guys. Yes. Yep. Thank you, Joe. Thank, Thank you, me. Nick. Yep.